Welcome to POTUS 2017, where we keep watch on the Oval Office and pour cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, ending Obamacare, not easy. The GOP is deeply divided on this, and the Democrats are not part of it, at least not yet. Will a new health care bill ever get passed? Senator John McCain, just diagnosed with an aggressive brain cancer, has his doubts. In a powerful speech to his colleagues, McCain offered some advice about how to restore the lost art of compromise. Stop listening to the bombastic loudmouths on the radio and television and the internet. To hell with them. They don't want anything done for the public good. Our incapacity is their livelihood. Let's trust each other. Let's return to regular order. We've been spinning our wheels on too many important issues because we keep trying to find a way to win without help from across the aisle. That's an approach that's been employed by both sides, mandating legislation from the top down without any support from the other side, with all the parliamentary maneuvers that requires. We're getting nothing done, my friends. We're getting nothing done. McCain would like to see the whole health care process start over, this time using not secret negotiations, but the traditional route, with legislation emerging from a committee with GOP and Democratic members. If McCain can dream, why not us? What might a compromise health care bill look like? On the substance, is there any common ground on health care? And if not common ground, what might each side be willing to give up? Joining us, Paul Howard, Director of Health Policy at the conservative think tank, the Manhattan Institute, and Sarah Collins, Vice President for Health Matters at the Progressive Commonwealth Fund. Welcome back, both of you. Um, after John McCain gave his speech, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut went on MSNBC and said he sees the bones of a Democratic-Republican compromise on health care. It's that Republicans want cheaper, more bare-bones policies to be available for lower premiums in the marketplace. Democrats want the stability of knowing that you're insured for pretty much everyone. If they respect each other on that, uh, then they can find a way to work it out. Paul, do you agree? I do think if you peer far enough ahead into the future, there is an outline here. Republicans want more competition in the market. They want more choice. There are things they really object to in Obamacare, particularly the individual mandate, particularly the heavy regulation. But at the end of the day, if you look at the individual insurance market, it's a residual market. Fixing it's going to require a mix of government subsidies for people who are too poor or too sick to afford them and really affordable plans for price-sensitive consumers who are healthy most of the time and just want to be insured against a catastrophic illness. So getting that right balance, I think, could give everybody what they want. So what are the, since you're representing more of the Republican sides, what do the Republicans give up to get Democrats into the tent on that? Well, you know, I think that there are, there are some things that Democrats would appreciate. Reinsurance, for instance, if there was a... You know, and there's money. There's a lot of money. There's hundreds of billions of dollars in BICRA, the, the Better Care Act right now on the Senate side. But if they were just to say, look, we're going to take that money, we're going to explicitly target it at reinsurance for these very expensive patients, you could probably get some Democratic votes on that. Um, I think that's the place to kind of focus on stabilization efforts. We'll probably get some Democratic buy-in. Sarah, same question. Does Chris Murphy have the bones of a compromise there? I think so. I think that the marketplaces are the immediate concern um, for policymakers. Um, where we know that insurers are not offering plans in about 40 counties. That's not a lot of counties in the market in the in the United States, but it's. Um, it means that people won't have access to a plan if they want to buy one next year. Um, we also know that we're seeing somewhat little higher um, premium increases in the marketplaces than we otherwise might have seen um, because of some of the uncertainty um, on the part of the Trump administration's approach to the marketplaces. So Congress could immediately um, make a mandatory appropriation to, um, to fund the cost-sharing reduction plans that insurance carriers are required to offer under the Affordable Care Act. 
that is a that is a policy proposal in the Senate health care bill um, and also in the House health House bill. Um, that is one one approach. Um, and ca- is and can there be a fallback option for these counties that don't have insurers? Might people be able to buy into the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, for example, or the Medicaid expansion in states that have expanded their Medicaid programs? And I agree with Paul on the stabilization um, issue, reinsurance. Um, that funding is appropriated in the Senate in the Senate bill and the House bill. Reinsurance basically means allowing insurance companies to buy insurance to help them pay for their most expensive, sickest uh, policyholders, which lets them keep the policies a little lower for those people, correct? That's right. And it was part of the Affordable Care Act for three years, and then it phased out. And as a result of that phase out, we did see somewhat higher premiums last year or this year because of because of the phase out. So that would lower premiums next year. So for you, representing the more liberal position, mm-hmm. what would you be willing to give up? Would you be willing to see the essential benefits package weakened so that there could be uh, cheaper, more bare-bones policy uh, options for consumers to buy with lower premiums. I think a guiding principle for both Republicans and Democrats is is to first do no harm. So let's let can we look at policy solutions That's a that no. won't <laughs> increase <laughs> that won't increase um, the uninsured rate, for example. People won't lose coverage. Um, people who have pre-existing conditions will still be able to get the health care that they need, the cut the benefits that they need, um, and people shouldn't have to pay a lot more than they're paying than they're paying now. So I think that that should be a standard that that any changes to the to the law um, has to meet. Why are conservatives so against the essential benefits package? And we know this is a really big Ted Cruz thing, for example, right? He, he wants there to be, I think, the ability to offer uh, pre, uh, premiums or policies, I should say, that are super bare bones. The Democrats would say, those are just junk policies. They don't cover much. Consumers don't realize that they're buying so little when they buy those policies until they get sick. You know, I think that uh, there was some research done on the individual market by Mark Pauly at Wharton and others before the ACA, and they found there actually was a balance of people who were healthier risks and higher risks in the market. Insurers are not going to only offer plans that are super bare bones and super high risk. People don't want to buy those. I think they're going to offer balanced plans. I think the objection is from the Republican side, the conservative side, telling people what they have to buy. I think another potential compromise would be saying, like, look, okay. Um, we're going to have these essential health benefits, but let them vary cost sharing. Let them vary how people choose where they're going to take their cost sharing across different benefits. So I think that could offer more flexibility in the market, and you could still have a, you know, a, a richer plan for people who wanted that plan. It's also a stabilization issue. So we can have people with different kinds of health plans in an individual market. Everyone really needs to have the same, the same benefit package. The cost, cost sharing can vary, but it would be very destabilizing if some people had different health plans. Okay. Go ahead. I'm just, I mean, just to recognize. You disagree on this. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it, it's just, you know, we'd recognize, I think, probably agree that there are about six and a half million people right now. The IRS is charging them the individual mandate. So those people are sitting out the market. I think there's a, a 12 million. I could be wrong about that fear. There are a lot of other people who've gotten individual exemptions from the, from the, the uh, mandate because the cost of coverage was so high. So there are people sitting out the market today that we know are not buying in. So I think, you know, trying to address, I think, you know, serious concerns about, people with pre-existing conditions, high health costs, being able to access coverage, but also recognize the way the market's set up today. If you don't get very generous federal subsidies, you, you are facing a, a ten or a $12,000 out-of-pocket cost right now. Um, to that point, kind of to that point, one of the things that the Republican bill, uh, the various Republican bills would, would allow, I think, is the uh, reinstatement by the insurance companies of annual caps on benefits or lifetime caps on benefits. In other words, one of the things Obamacare put in was that if you get really, really sick and it's really, really expensive, the insur- your insurance policy can't say, and again, this is something that people probably don't even realize is in there when they buy insurance, that you know the maximum amount that the insurance company will pay for your illness is X in a year or X in your life. Why do the Republicans want that back in there? 
Well, you know, I, I think this is probably not a big issue. I, I wouldn't really hang my whole hat on this. The number of people who would be impacted by this is very, very small. At the other end of the spectrum, having some cap in there actually incentivizes payers, um, pardon me, uh, hospitals and drug companies to keep their prices down. Because if they know they're going to get the cap and they're not going to be paid anything after that, they keep prices down. So opening that up, I think, is kind of a double-edged sword. But I think that what Republicans should focus on is the things that make the market work better and make it more competitive for the vast majority of people in the market. And that's the place where I think you can really start to bring costs down. Anything on those annual or lifetime caps? Well, we had those before. And, yes, and, and, they, and it didn't incentivize hospitals to reduce their prices. So we can't, we can't pl- place the whole market um, 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 dynamic on the consumer. Consumers shouldn't have to be the ones that drive um, how hospitals behave. Um, this, these have been very, very important in terms of reducing bankruptcies, medical bankruptcies, reducing people's out-of-pocket costs. So I think that's a very, those are very important consumer protections. Do you think it matters... Um, this debate that we hear sometimes whether health care is a right versus health care is like other commodities in the marketplace. You can buy as much quality health care as you can afford based on how well you do in your career. Does that matter as a philosophical concept? I think what really matters, these are very practical questions, whether you know, people really need to have health insurance coverage in order to get health care. That's, that's that's been that's pretty definitive. All the research shows that people who aren't don't have health insurance get about half the care that people who do have health insurance all year. If we want a strong, well-performing health care system, we really need to have everybody in the system. Some work that the Commonwealth Fund just released recently showed that we still lag other countries, other industrialized countries, on, on health care performance. And one of the main reasons is we still have about 28 million people who are who are uninsured. So I think it's a it's a it's very important for people to have health insurance. People want health insurance. We've seen people in this repeal and debate, um, repeal, repeal and replace debate, come out and talk about how important these coverage expansions have been to them. Um, and it's also just incredibly important just to have a well-functioning health care system. And Republicans will, I think, dig in for the most part on the idea that health care is not a right. Free speech is a right. Uh, you know, freedom from uh, government um, on fair search and seizure is a right. Health care is not a right. Does, does that matter? You know, from I think the classical kind of liberal perspective uh, on this, the conservative perspective on this, is that you have negative rights against government, even in states that are countries that have, you know, universal single payer systems. They set limits on what they consume. The person doesn't have a right. They have a menu of things that are provided by the state, but it's not an absolute right. But one thing I would say is I don't think it gets us that far. I think what you know, I think we should aspire towards universal coverage that's affordable and effective. I think we have a big problem with healthcare spending in the U.S. And I actually think that at the margins, a lot of the healthcare spending we do do um, does not improve health. That giving people jobs, better education, better communities, that the opioid crisis that's hitting us right now is, is about a lot of other things than insurance. And we have to tackle those problems. And there have been studies that have shown that even for people who have coverage, health status varies really widely based on behavioral factors and economic factors. So I think thinking more broadly about these challenges and putting money back in people's pockets by lowering the cost of health care is also something we need to think about. Sarah, what about that? We do, you'd probably agree, the two of you, that this country spends more money than other countries for outcomes that are no better or even worse. And so if we could find the places to stop spending money, then it relieves some of the pressure, at least, on the whole system. It would be easier to cover everybody. It's really important to address the underlying rate of growth in health care costs. Um, I think it is, again, it's the insurance coverage is a necessary condition. It's not sufficient in terms of guaranteeing people access to health care. Um, but it really is important that both Republicans and Democrats look at the underlying rate of health care costs and look at changes in the delivery system that will help improve um, our, our, the way we spend health um, our health care dollars. Um, right now, we're just we're, we are spending a lot more than other other, other countries. There are reforms in the Affordable Care Act that addressed that, um, but more work certainly needs to be done. It'll help lower premiums, premium growth over time. And I also think that we really need to look at how much people have to pay out of pocket, even when they have health insurance. So deductibles are rising very rapidly in employer-based plans. It's nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act, um, but it really does prevent people from getting the health care that they need. We need to really, really think about how we're designing health benefits to ensure that people get the health care that they need. Does it matter politically? politically what the members of Congress themselves get for their health coverage. I think currently under Obamacare, they have to buy 
their policies um, on the exchanges using the same choices that people who buy Obamacare policies have. Um, so I don't know how well that covers John McCain for his brain cancer or not mm -hmm. with what he has. But if this is repealed under the Republican bills as they stand, what, what do members of Congress have? Because one of the things that people certainly uh, have a right to say and say politically in this country is, why do you, our elected officials, get great health coverage, which could be government employees' health coverage, and we have to scramble in the economy? I think that's a great question, and it really, it really begs the question, too, of why should anybody have health insurance coverage when, and somebody else be denied the opportunity to have health insurance coverage? This is a, a universal issue for people. Everybody has health care concerns. Everybody should have comprehensive benefits that are affordable to them, enables them to get the health care that they need. Do you know what's in the, the Senate or the House bill with respect to members of Congress in particular? Would they go off the Obamacare exchanges? You don't know. I'm not sure. Do you know? I think the issue right now is that unlike, I'll say, a large employer, if a large employer sent someone to the exchange, they couldn't give them an additional subsidy to cover the cost. So right now, I believe members of Congress, they do go to, the, I think, the small business exchange, but they also get their, basically, their FEHBP subsidy with them. So they get advantage in a way that someone who's just shopping on the exchanges doesn't. Um, if we called it, if we didn't call it Obamacare, or didn't call it Obamacare repeal, which is a lightning rod either way, could they come to some kind of compromise? Do you, do you think, you know, call it Fred and Ethel, call it something, um, just not Obamacare or not Obamacare repeal. Would that move the ball or would there be too much reaction against that on both sides politically? You know, it is technically called the Affordable Care Act. Um, so, um, or Affordable Care Act Affordable repeal. Care Act, but certainly it could be renamed. Um, we might, maybe we would see, there are about 19 states that have an expanded eligibility for the Medicaid programs. Maybe those 19 states would move forward. President actually. Obama said, you can call it Obamacare, <laughs> I, I own it. You know, I think there, there is, you know, some ground here, again, to our earlier discussion. So, you know, some states like New York, California, others, Connecticut, actually under programs like Medicaid spend a lot more than poorer states. A lot of the red states, the poorer states on a per capita basis haven't expanded. If Republicans and Democrats could come to an agreement on, say, a national Medicaid level in which everybody below that gets Medicaid, everybody above that is going to go into the private insurance exchange, maybe we're going to allow, I think copper plans were some idea that Democrats, some Democrats floated a few years ago. Mm. So allow that kind of choice. That would be a blend of ideas. But you bring up the states, and I think what we're seeing is there's a difference between the Republican governors and the Republicans in Congress. The Republican governors are much more defensive of the Affordable Care Act because they see, it, with, with some exceptions, because they see it benefiting especially poor and older and disabled people in their states, right? Right. I mean, I think that this is the, this is the, this is the concern, is that I think that Medicaid reform could get through if you felt that the individual market had a really strong market. So the actuarial value of the plans under BICRA right now is 58%. That's certainly probably too low for people who have Medicaid coverage right now. So again, we've actually got several hundred billion dollars in the Senate bill uh, sloshing around, so to speak, that could be more effectively targeted, raise the actuarial, actuarial value of the plans, um, provide some backstops for Medicaid that would make those Republican governors more comfortable and possibly make some Democrats more comfortable as well. A last word on that point? I think, it, I think that there's, there is certainly room left in the Affordable Care Act to make improvements in affordability, too. So we could, we could increase um, people's premium tax credits to bring more, more young people in. We could lift the cap, um, so make it possible for people earning more than $50,000 a year to be eligible for the tax credits. So there are ways, even within the structure of the Affordable Care Act, to bring more people into the system, more healthy people into the risk pools. Thank you both very much for having this important conversation. We're not going to solve health care today, but maybe we moved a few inches forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And stay with us because on health care, we're about to bring on some additional evidence. Time for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold, hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. The overheated rhetoric says Obamacare is a total disaster. 
But look closely at its effect on women with breast cancer, and one finds a clear beneficial effect. A new study published in the journal Cancer Epidemiology finds that during the Affordable Care Act years, more breast cancer diagnoses have been made at earlier stages. The paper also found Latinas especially benefited with earlier detections. This is no small issue. According to the American Breast Cancer Society, women will face 250,000 invasive cases this year with 40,000 deaths, something for lawmakers to keep in mind as they modify Obamacare. To discuss the study is lead author Abigail Silva, professor of public health at Loyola University. She joins us from Chicago and still with us in our studio is Sarah Collins from the Commonwealth Fund. Professor, would you tell our viewers what exactly you studied? What did you set out to measure? Sure. Uh, thank you. It's very. It's an honor to be here today. Um, so let me give you a little bit of back background about the premise of the study. Uh, as you well pointed out, a quarter of a million women are diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, and most of them are detected in an early stage, um, which, which bears a, a better prognosis, right? But in the United States, unfortunately, compared to non-Latina white women, African American and Latina women are diagnosed at a later stage. Now, we know that um, breast, breast cancer screening, such as mammography, is effective at identifying early stage breast cancer. Unfortunately, again, compared to non-Latina white women, African American and Latina women are less likely um, to either uh, obtain a mammography or receive mammography during the recommended intervals. Um, and we also know that out-of-pocket expenses for mammography is a one of the barriers to receiving breast cancer screening. So one of the provisions from the Affordable Care Act is the preventative services provision that was implemented in 2011. What that did was eliminate out-of-pocket expenses for preventative services with a high level of evidence, uh, such as immunizations and uh, cancer screening, such as breast cancer, colorectal cancer, um, cervical cancer, and lung cancer. Um, so we, uh, we, our objective for the study was twofold. One, um, will this potentially lead to a shift in early stage diagnosis? Uh, it presumably more women are getting screened or have an easier access to, to mammography because of the removal of the cost. So that's one question. And the second question, would, would it lead to a reduction in, breast can uh, in, uh, in the disparity that we observe at uh, cancer diagnosis? And? And so what we found, the first question, we did see an overall shift or an improvement towards uh, uh, stage one cancer diagnosis. Overall, for all the women, uh, that included non-Latina white, uh, African-American, and Latina women, as you well pointed out. And the shift was slightly higher for uh, African-American and Latina women. So, so does that, that indicate that more of those women are getting screened at all than before? Or does it indicate a shift in the timing when those women are getting screened to find those earlier diagnoses? That's a great question. We didn't, we, with this data set, because we used a national data set of breast cancer uh, diagnoses in the United States, we didn't have mammography information. So we didn't do directly look at that question, but based on, um, we deferred that, you know, that that might increase mammography screening, which might lead to an earlier cancer diagnosis. So, so we can did that you, directly, if you will. Can you draw a conclusion from your data that the difference between being insured and not being insured mattered to these earlier diagnoses? We actually looked at only insured women, uh, women who are on Medicare and women who had private insurance, because that's what the provision was, you know, looking at the, uh, the provision for those with insurance, right? They no longer had uh, out-of-pocket payments. So I can't actually speak to the fact that it was about insurance. Um, again, we, def you know, we uh, were looking more at the out-of-pocket expense barrier. Sarah? And, and Dr. Silva, do you, would you expect to see, or did you, did you see in the data, or would you expect to see in the data, um, improvement in life expectancy um, or a decline in, um, in mortality among women who got this early, earlier screening? That's a great question. I mean, that's not something that we looked at, but I think that quality of life, if these women would have been diagnosed at some point, um, you can infer that quality of life would be better being diagnosed at stage one than say stage two or three cancers. Does that make sense? It sounds like you're saying that these earlier diagnoses, which presumably will result in longer lives and better quality of lives, um, increased during the period that Obamacare has been in effect. But you can't quite 
say, you can't quite close the loop to say it's happening because of the Affordable Care Act. If it's not happening because of the Affordable Care Act, what would an alternative explanation be? Um, I think that it, we did two things. So we uh, did a sensitivity analysis where we looked at, again, um, for this particular objective, we looked at the two or three years before the implementation of this provision and then the two years after the implementation of the provision. And we saw on average a shift of about three to four percent. Okay, But there was um, some thinking that, well, actually we've been doing pretty good in terms of breast cancer diagnosis and earlier stage. There was a trend towards an increase in earlier stage overall nationally. Um, however, we looked at the period even before that pre-period. So the two or three years even before that, and sure enough, we did see a trend, like an increase in about one and a half percent, right? So even though it's an increase, it's not quite the three percent and the four percent shift that we saw. So it, it gives a little bit more evidence, a little bit more evidence as to uh, we were trying to ask. It, and it, so it indicates that the act, that exactly. provision of the act, did have an impact. So Sarah, how does this fit politically into the conversation we were having? earlier in the show. I haven't heard any Democratic senators, for example, bring up this statistic and say, you see, this is why Obamacare is important or why certain provisions of Obamacare are important. Are important. Does this have political ramifications? I think so. And I think it brings the debate back down to people's health care, which has actually been missing from the debate. We've been talking more about the politics of repeal, about tax reform. And this really does bring it back to what, it re what these coverage expansions have really meant to people. Women having better access to preventive care services, people able to get afford their medications for their diabetes for the first time in their lives, for example. So I really do think it helps bring that back to the 30 million people or so who have gotten coverage through the marketplaces and through Medicaid and why it's been so why these coverage expenses have been so important. Do you think it's a coincidence that the biggest defectors from the Republican health care bill have been the Republican women in the Senate, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, uh, Capito from West Virginia? You know, in the studies that we've done at the Commonwealth Fund, our survey research shows that women interface with the healthcare system more than men and families. They're, they're not only use the system more, particularly when they're younger, but they're also the main um, arbiters of, of health care in their families, helping their children get to, get to the doctor when they need to. So it's not, not surprising that women are much more concerned about the health aspects of reform. Thank you both very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's POTUS 2017 for today. We are here each week at this hour pouring cold, hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thank you for watching.